agenda for you today. We're going to give you a little bit of an overview uh, about uh, the uh, the pathway to settlement uh, when you're starting a business in the UK and what are some of the details and how does it kind of work through. Um, we've had a lot of questions uh, that uh, delegates have asked us uh, before at the time of registration. Um, if today you have questions, uh, use the Q&A box to write in your questions. And uh, what we will be doing is we'll look at taking up uh, these questions at the end of this session. And uh, I will look at answering those questions as we go along as well. Uh, but we have uh, you know, a separate slot for um, Q&A at the end, so we'll take it up then. Uh, so before we kick off, just a quick uh, disclaimer. So the information that you will hear today um, is, uh, is based on the immigration rules. Uh, but as it happens with uh, not only UK immigration, but for any other country that you would look at, um, there could be specific instances which could be relevant to you. That could be areas that could be more, uh, you know, a preferred route for you. So use this information as a starting point uh, to, to begin your journey on the exploration. And, and if you want a specific individual opinion which is relevant to your circumstances, uh, then you can reach out to us and you know we'll be happy to to address it uh, from your perspective so what we're going to look at today is um, you know starting a business in the uk why is that such a great uh, opportunity um how is that a pathway to citizenship um in in uh, for for the uk what are some of the popular routes uh, that you know everybody's kind of looking at and, and obviously the Q&A session. So we've got a bulk of the time for your questions to get answered. So, um, you know, use the Q&A box, start putting the questions in as it comes across. And, uh, you know, we will be taking that up um, as, we, as we kind of go along. Right, so it's no surprise, uh, you know, in terms of the popularity for uh, UK uh, as a destination, because it's quite an easy place to, to set up and, and run a business. It takes only about a, a couple of weeks to, to be up and running. I mean, registering a company with the company's house is an online process. You could probably do it in a couple of days' time. Um, so, so it's really that easy to be up and running in terms of a business setup. It's regarded as a world leader in innovation. Uh, just in 2020, there were almost 20,000 tech startups that started in one year alone, uh, which gives you an idea about the kind of environment, the ecosystem uh, that, that can be offered to new businesses, because the survival rate, which is, you know, you have a lot of businesses which will start, but how many of them will actually go the distance? The five-year startup survival rate is almost 43%. So if you're starting a business in the UK, five years down the line, every one in two business will survive, which is a remarkable uh, statistic uh, in, in terms of from an entrepreneur perspective, as well as from, uh, from a business uh, point of view as well. And, and here's an, an interesting fact, despite the, the COVID-19 uh, you know, pandemic that we've kind of been through and are still going through, 67% of small and medium, uh, medium employers they generated a profit or a surplus in the last financial year. So it is, it is a great growth story, even during the pandemic. So um, almost two thirds of the businesses were generating some kind of a profit or a surplus uh, in, in, even in these times. So again, goes on to show how um, interesting it is from, from a business point of view uh, for, from a survival as well as uh, thriving uh, from a business perspective. Um, it offers a competitive tax environment, so it's not, not a tax haven like the Caribbean countries, but at the same time, it has a, a competitive tax scenario, especially when you look at other kind of developed countries. Uh, it offers the businesses a, a stable environment, especially in terms of the rules, the regulations, the changes. Uh, they don't come as often, and, and if they're coming, then there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of awareness and there's a lot of information so businesses and individuals can be prepared when those changes are coming in and a lot of resources are, are made available as well uh, in that process. Um, if you wanted to get global talent, it's, it's really a great place uh, to be, uh, you know, in terms of uh, finding out a lot of talent because you get students from around the world who are finishing courses uh, in the UK. And, and recently, uh, UK has also introduced a graduate route, which means 
if you are finishing a course, uh, a graduate or a master's or even a PhD, you could get a minimum of two years or three years of, of work permission without having any kind of a job offer. So really the talent pool is, is kind of, you know, going to go up once you have all these new graduates who are going to be joining the workforce and and quite simply it's 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 an environment which uh, you know is a melting pot of different cultures and and it's really easy to find your feet uh, you know in the country even if you've never traveled before and once you're kind of through that process and 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 you know you get onto your uh, your citizenship pathway um as a British citizen, you hold the seventh strongest passport, so you can travel to almost 185 countries and visa free, uh, which is great. You have a right of abode, which means you could stay for as long or as little in the country, travel in or out or relocate elsewhere and still be able to get back to the UK without any uh, without any issues. You get access to the health care, you could stand for public office. And, and here's a benefit that not a lot of people think about quite a lot, but the, the social safety net that is offered by uh, the UK to its citizens, it kind of allows you to take a little bit more risk when it comes to doing business, it comes to uh, taking that chance because you know that there is a little bit of a safety net for you, uh, even if things don't work out. So that's, that's another plus point, uh, which, is, uh, you know, which is available once, uh, once you have your rights and you've established yourself in the country. Now, essentially for any visa route that we look at uh, from UK's perspective, the pathway to citizenship follows almost a similar track. Uh, in most cases, you are granted an initial visa, which is valid for three years. You can then extend it for another two years. And at the end of five years, if you've lived in the UK on a settlement visa route, then you could apply for an indefinite leave to remain. Now, what are the settlement visa routes? So um, skilled worker visa is a settlement route. The tier one investor is one. The global talent is one. Uh, the sole representative visa is one. Uh, so these are all settlement visa routes. The non-settlement visa routes are like uh, your student visas. So you know, if you're going to be studying, say, a bachelor's course and then a master's course, followed by a PhD if you're so inclined, and you're spending a length of time in country, automatically spending five years just on a bachelor's and a master's will not give you a, a permanent residence because student visas are not uh, settlement visas. So that's a kind of a slight difference. But uh, if you're in the UK for 10 years, uh, then you can look at uh, applying under the long stay route. And typically when you are applying for settlement, uh, you'll be required to meet the English language test. You need to pass a life in the UK test. And more importantly, you have to spend at least six months in a 12-month period, you know, in order to justify your, your residency in the UK to show that, you know, you made UK your permanent home. And once you have your indefinite leave to remain, then you could look at naturalizing as a, as a British citizen, uh, which, is, which is essentially what the pathway is. So the good thing about the UK immigration program is that the pathways are so clearly laid out that there is no ambiguity. You know, you know that once you have an entry clearance, these are the requirements you need to meet for extension. This is what you need to meet for settlement. And this is when the residency will happen. And unlike some countries like in the US, there are no country specific quotas as well. So it's not that if you are an Indian origin person, then you, know, you need to wait because uh, your quotas might be longer, whether you're Indian or Chinese. And, and you know, if you have another nationality, then it might be a bit more quicker for you to get settlement. So it doesn't work that way, which is great. Everyone is on par and uh, you know exactly how the, the process is gonna pan out for you once you join in that process. So that's, that's, that's again, the transparency, which is, which is great from, uh, from a migration perspective. Now, before we kind of go any further, uh, just a little bit of an insight in terms of who we are and, and what kind of gives us a little bit more credibility to talk about this. So um, we are an immigration law firm. We advise and assist clients in their global uh, expansion and global mobility areas. We have clients in 26 plus countries and we've got thousands of success stories uh, all around the world in different visa categories for different countries. 
uh, you know, you can check us out on Facebook, on Google, you know, we've got reviews from clients who are kind of uh, experienced the services firsthand and, and you know, they've, they've shared their uh, experiences. Um, as a professional body, we are members of the Law Society, we're members of the Immigration Law Practitioners Association. Uh, we've also won a bunch of awards from Who's for Legal, uh, from the corporate immigration side of things. So essentially, we, we have established our credibility over the last kind of 15 odd years in the field of global mobility, demonstrating success, helping clients to build their success stories. Um, we've helped clients in, in different industries or from different industries, uh, whether it be gems and jewelry, training and development, uh, even heavy industries, air engineering, or, or the smaller engineering products, textiles, startup businesses, um, legacy businesses, which have been around for, for almost 100 years or so. So we've got a diverse range of clientele. We've got a diverse range of industries that our clients come from. So what all of this has done for us is it has given, our ability, given us the ability to identify what can be the best possible route or what can be the best possible pathway for an individual and you know how can they look at making it happen so it's helped us to build in a more kind of a solution oriented approach and and it's exciting because you know our clients have gone on to do bigger things uh, you know when they've made those decisions whether it is starting new operations whether it is investing more money overseas whether it is uh, you know joining in reputed bodies around the world and, and you know, we, it's glad for us to, to see that, you know, we paid some part in, in facilitating all of that. So that's a little bit about us and that's a little bit about our, our work that we've done. Now, going right into the meat of the issue in terms of, you know, how can one look at starting a business in UK? Well, typically, you know, there is, there is a whole spectrum which you could go with. At one end of the spectrum, and uh, you know, is, is the tier one investor visas. Now these are for really high net worth individuals who, who are able to make an investment of at least 2 million pounds, which is about 20 CR in, in today's repeat terms. And essentially they can take this money and put it in their own company in the UK and then use that money towards construction, whether they want to get into housing, whether they want to get into any other kind of a business, real estate, uh, they could put that money in that way. And, and it's a fantastic route because it doesn't have an English language requirement. It's probably the only category from a UK visa perspective that, that you know, obviously does not require for the investor to be able to speak the language. Even if you're not proficient in English, you could still look at making an application. And it is really amusing because we see a lot of our clients in this category of visa there are typically landowners who have, uh, you know, ancestral properties or who have land which they have sold or they have stocks and equity which they have sold and they use that money to then apply under this particular category. And it allows you to take your spouse and children uh, till the age of 18 to join you as dependents on this particular category. And as I said, you could put the money in, into a business in the UK and it could be in any domain. So that's one end of the spectrum. Um, we also work with a lot of businesses uh, on the corporate side of things who want to set up a presence in the UK and uh, they want to then send either their senior employees or their uh, middle or junior level employees to go and work in that particular subsidiary. And that route is the tier two or the sponsor license route. And that kind of falls under the points based system. So when you look at the skilled worker visa, or when you look at the intra-company transfer, all of that falls under this category. So this is defined by the fact that there is a company in the UK, which has been set up, and then it is bringing in employees to that particular company. And, and this generally works for, for bigger corporate setups or where people have more than one person who's looking at migrating or more than one person who's looking at setting up a business, uh, then that's, that's a great route to, to kind of explore. We've seen a lot of buzz over the last couple of years on the innovator and the startup visa routes. Now these are, are incredible routes 
if you are somebody who's got a, a crazy innovative idea, who is on that path to look at making a difference uh, by offering something which is very unique and different, they could look at going in on the innovator visa. If you have a little bit more experience, you have some capital that you're prepared to invest. So, so it's about 50,000 pounds that you can look at investing on the innovator visa. The starter visa actually does not have any investment criteria. So that's great. And, and it's especially good for uh, career freshers, especially good for people who want to make a start on a new and an innovative business in the UK. So, you know, if, if you are one of those people, we'd be happy to have a chat with you, understand your concept, understand your idea, help you to kind of flesh it out a little bit more, and then make an application under, uh, you know, under this particular route. So that's the innovator or the startup uh, visa route that we look at. Um, of particular interest is the sole representative visa or representative of an overseas business. Now, this is one of the most popular routes that we see uh, to bring business into the UK because unlike the other categories, this one doesn't have a minimum investment criteria and it is not only geared towards those radical, innovative, ideas-driven people, but even regular businesses, old school businesses, legacy businesses can look at applying under this. So there's no restriction that you have to be somebody who is very tech-driven, who's got a, a techie business idea. Uh, but even if you had a regular trading business, you were into training, you were into textiles, retail, gold jewelries, whatever, you will still be eligible to apply under this particular category. So officially, the sole representative visa is known as the representative of an overseas business. Now, as the term suggests, overseas business means any business outside of the UK. So, you know, we have clients from India, we have clients from Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, you know, West Africa, Middle East even. So any business which is based outside the UK can nominate a representative to enter the UK and set up a branch or a subsidiary. So when a business nominates a person, the person can enter the UK, set up a wholly owned branch or a subsidiary on behalf of the overseas business. And this will give the business an opportunity to tap into the UK market without committing to a huge amount in terms of investment, without having to have the pressure to say that, you know, we have to generate a certain minimum amount for a turnover or to employ people. So in that case, it becomes a fantastic entry, entry route into the new market. And it also allows the applicant to bring in their family members. So a spouse and children till the age of 18 years can join the main applicant in the UK the spouse can work full time, the kids can work if they're eligible to or in that age group, and it becomes a pathway for settlement for everyone. So unlike, uh, you know, countries which would generally say that you age out of a process and the kids can no longer continue. If your kids have entered the UK before, before they turned 18, they can continue to remain in the UK, get the settlement, become a citizen, even if they age out. So, you know, even they cross that threshold, they're still able to do that. So that's, that's an amazing opportunity that gets offered to individuals to naturalize, uh, not only for themselves, but also for their families. And once you're there in the UK, you are eligible for a mortgage, you could look at buying property, residential, commercial, land if you wanted to, and, and you can take the advantage of the lower interest rate. So, Typically, the interest rates in the UK vary between 1% to 2% on the housing side. Project finance can be availed easily as well. So you can get access to comparatively a cheaper capital uh, when you have permission to live and work in the country. So that's, again, again, a great thing. You could make investments in other companies and businesses. So, you know, we have uh, local partners like Hamilton Businesses, we're also on this call today, uh, who offer in investment opportunities um, to clients, uh, whether it is, uh, you know, whether they want to buy uh, hotels or that they want to buy other companies, whether they want to make investments in construction. Um, so we can handhold them through the, through the entire process. And 
And it's quite interesting to, to kind of have this as a pathway uh, because it allows the company to test the waters in the UK without making a commitment of a substantial investment. So unlike a tier one investor, you're not taking in 2 million in straight away to, to look at investing. You could subsequently choose to bring in the money, but then that's an, on your timetable. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, what are the criteria that we, we want the applicants to meet? So typically a sole representative must be a direct employee. So they should not be an agent or a reseller who is being appointed or on a commission uh, or somebody who's a marketing representative for that business, but they have to be an employee. An employee can have a business development role. So a lot of our um, clients would want to send somebody who is a business development manager or who's a sales head or who's an international business head. So as an employee, you could have a sales function or a business development function but you cannot be somebody who's outside of the setup. You have to be somebody who is, uh, who is part, of the, part of the company. And, and that is something which is, uh, which is really, really important. Now, typically a sole representative cannot be a majority shareholder as well. So either directly or indirectly through, uh, you know, through, uh, through surrogates or something on those lines, you should not be owning more than 50% of the shares or controlling more than 50% of the voting rights. If you are a owner of your own business, if you're a sole proprietor, and if you wanted to kind of identify this route to for yourself, then that's not going to be feasible. You can nominate one of your employees to enter the UK as a sole representative. But if you are the sole proprietor, if you own your business 100%, then you wouldn't be able to make that make that jump. So then we'll have to figure out another route, whether it is the tier two on the sponsor license side, which could be a better uh, proposition, or if your business is, is innovative, then maybe you could consider the, the innovator visa uh, as a pathway as well. So that's just one of the caveats that, that you have to be uh, cautious about. It's not compulsory for someone to be a shareholder in a company. So even if a person has no shares, that's fine. But if they do have a share in the business, then it should not be a majority shareholding. And essentially, well, a lot of times you get this question, and I can see this coming along in our, our Q&A boxes as well, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, who could be a, a, a sole representative? Can they be a spouse? Can they be a sibling? Um, so yes, I mean, they could be a sibling, that's no problem. So if, uh, you know, one of the family members was running the business as a proprietorship, they wanted to nominate their sibling to be the sole representative, that's perfectly fine. I mean, it's no problem. And if the sibling is working in the business, then they could look at, uh, you know, entering in as a sole rep as well. Again, that's not a problem. Um, a lot of times people ask, and, and I can see this coming through as well right now, is what is the turnover that a business is looking at? Well, the short answer is, it's not about a minimum number. You know, we've helped businesses which are in the startup phase, so they have zero revenue, and they have been able to nominate representatives. We have uh, clients who are turning over as, uh, you know, about three to four CR in, in Indian rupee terms. That's about 200,000 pounds or, uh, or $250,000. Uh, in turnover, and they're able to nominate uh, sole representatives as well. So as long as the business can demonstrate that it is actively trading and it has a presence outside of UK, so it's headquartered outside the UK, it could be anywhere, and it could have multiple branches outside the UK, even that's not a problem, um, they can be eligible to make an application. Now, typically, what we're saying is, when a business is nominating an employee, they need to be able to show that they have adequate funds to support the branch in the UK. Now, the difference is you don't have to commit to making an investment, but you have to be able to show that you will be able to pay salaries for the person that you're sending to the UK. You'll be able to meet, meet the expenses for marketing, uh, for an office setup, if you were looking at it, or a warehouse, if you wanted to get it. So you have sufficient funds to start off on that process without taking recourse to any public funds. So that's, that's the important uh, kind of, you know, criteria 
uh, that the that the Home Office would be looking at when they're looking at the, deciding on the application. Now, applicants have to be outside the UK for sure, and uh, they have to be an employee of the business. They could even be working in a media house, you know. So you could be a correspondent, you could be a reporter, you could be an editor. Um, you could even look at that from a media's perspective. So it's not only related to business, but even from a media perspective. And the employee's role must be at a senior level. So, you know, it says senior employees everywhere on the guidance, on the rule book. But, and a lot of times people wonder that, okay, a senior employee, how old must a person be? You know, so should they be 40 or 50, uh, you know, in order to be classed as a senior employee? Well, not really. I mean, if you are, it's not a deal breaker, you'll still be able to get in. But we've done applications for individuals who are in their 20s, they're 22, 23. So it's not about the age of the person, but it's about what kind of a job are they doing. So if your job is the one which could be classed at the senior level, then you'd be eligible to make an application. We've already covered the fact to say that you should not be a majority shareholder or a partner in the business. And unlike the investor, because you're not bringing in two million pounds at the moment, you would be looking at meeting the English language requirement. But again, this is at an A1 level. So if you can speak and listen English at the basic level, uh, which is at A1 level, then you would be eligible to, to take a test and then kind of look at entering in. And lastly, as we covered in, the business must have adequate funds to support this expansion. So if a business is able to show that they have maybe, say, £50,000 or £100,000 available in liquid funds or in working capital uh, or with the directors as part of their net worth, and that they would be prepared to make this investment in the UK if it is required or when it is required, then that is something which, which will meet the requirements for this particular category. So it's just like when you are uh, you know, considering making a visit visa application to another country, you, know, you show that you have access to a lot of funds. You, know, you have savings, you have stocks, you have mutual funds, you have uh, uh, assets in your home country. Now, the idea is that you're not going to spend all that money on your holiday. But what it does is it gives the, uh, the decision makers the confidence that you're not going to work illegally, you're not going to take public funds, you're not going to become a burden on the state. In the same way, when a company is choosing to send someone overseas, the company needs to demonstrate that it has sufficient funds, whether it is profits, whether it is share capital, whether it is reserves, uh, that they have all of it in order to be able to, to support their employee when they're there in the UK. When it comes to an extension, there is no minimum investment guarantee that you have to do. So you know, we advise clients to, to apply under the provincial programs for Canada. And if you're applying under the PNP, uh, you know, whether it is British Columbia or any other province, there is a minimum investment guarantee. So you commit to making an investment of uh, you know, $300,000 or $600,000. You commit to creating four to six full-time jobs. Um, but unlike those programs in Canada, the sole representative visa has no commitment from the business's perspective to generate jobs or to make investments. If you are able to do so, and, and if you are able to generate employment, then that's a bonus. It kind of helps with, uh, you know, with, with obviously your business perspective, but it's not an immigration requirement. And that is what sets this program apart from, from the other programs that you know, we advise clients on. And, and if you are an Indian business and if you are you know, into, into uh, products and services in India, it's a win-win scenario because from an Indian perspective, your GST on the exports are zero rated. So, so you know, you, you, you're not paying GST on that. You get incentives on exports when you're sending, uh, you know, and you're earning foreign exchange for the country. You have uh, duty-free imports is available for manufacturers to make export products. So, you know, if you want to bring something in, finish it off, and then export it from here by adding some value, again, you get you get a value add to that. You can secure your payments through the ECGC. You exports are a priority sector always. So, as an Indian business, you know, you are in a stronger position. Uh, because it's a win-win on both sides. The benefits that you would get in the UK, plus what you can get from your uh, from from structuring the transactions from your 
from your home country's uh, industry. So having understood the process, it's, it's worthwhile to see how the flow is going to work on this. So the first stage in this process is to, to do a, a personalized review. So what we do as a, as a company, uh, you know, we, we have an initial screening where we'll assess the feasibility to see whether or not you, you meet the requirements for this and uh, whether this is a good route forward for you or would there be another better route for you uh, or different route for you which would be more appropriate. If we're on the same page, if we can establish the eligibility, we then go on to prepare an application. The applicants then go into uh, for their biometric appointments. And um, once the their visas are granted, they have up to 90 days to travel to the UK. So it's not something that you have to act on immediately, but you have about another three months to, to make your travel plans and, and all the rest of it. And once you land in the UK, you know, we, we support you with, uh, with uh, your incorporation. If you need help with kind of concierge services to sort out your housing, schooling for the kids and things like that, you know, we have service providers who could do that, registering you for your health services, your national insurance with the HMRC and such. So all of that is kind of taken care of. And incredibly, this whole timeline can be completed in four to six weeks. And it's amazing because we've seen clients who want to take advantage of a business opportunity. So one of our clients is in the uh, in the business of making disposable plates and they're into packaging and such. And with the boom in, in kind of, you know, people staying at home, ordering in and all the rest of it, they saw an amazing opportunity for their disposables business, uh, for their packaging business, and they wanted to leverage that. And even though we started the process in the pandemic, uh, you know, they were able to finish this in four to six weeks time. They were able to get their person in into the country in the UK. And, uh, you know, we were delighted to learn recently that, you know, they actually doubled their sales over the last nine months uh, by just being in the right place and, and ensuring that, you know, they were able to surf that wave when it came through. So, in that scenario, this is an incredibly quick process. I mean, if you are exploring, say, the US or Canada, you know, those processes take at least three to five months and uh, they don't have the same kind of speed with which, uh, you know, on a single window, you could get the whole, whole process done. And we're able to, to kind of advise on this because it's not just a one, uh, one size for everyone kind of an approach that we have. Our expertise extends beyond the UK. You know, we can advise clients for um, expanding to the US, to Canada, to Portugal, or look at other options within Europe. So we have a variety of options and we have successfully represented our clients in all of these areas. So we actually do know what it takes uh, for someone to have a successful profile, for someone to be able to build uh, on these credentials and, uh, and and kind of, you know, find the right fitment for an individual. So, so again, that gives us the depth to think in the best interest of a client to say that, okay, this is how, you know, things could work through. And depending on the monies available for investments, depending on your life objectives, depending on what you wanted to do once you were, uh, you know, in another country, we can provide a, a tailor-made solution uh, 